dispute resolution. Oh my gosh, you mentioned disputes, but just the whole managing dispute resolution. And as we get into the industry caveat, when you're dealing with the big box guys, there's this thing called chargeback processing, like OMG. Talk about complicating receivables life, right? You sent them an invoice. Oh, but you violated a rule. We're going to charge you a dime. And then there's another 12 cents interest on the dime and tracking all the debits and credits and reconciling. It's a nightmare. Growing a business requires a holistic approach that extends beyond sales and marketing. This approach needs alignment among people, processes, and technologies. So if you're a business owner, operations, or finance leader looking to learn growth strategies from your peers and competitors, you're tuned into the right podcast. Welcome to the WBS Podcast, where scalable growth using business systems is our number one priority. Now... Here is your host, Sam Gupta. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the WBS Podcast. I'm Sam Gupta, your host and principal consultant at independent ERP and digital transformation consulting firm Elevate IQ. Account receivable function should be as easy as sending a bunch of invoices, making a few phone calls, and collecting cash. It must be the easiest job in the world, right? Well, once you get into the nuances of billing, you will quickly realize that it can get very complex with different payment arrangements, payment schedules, and partial payment options. Each industry may have its own requirements on how AR is supposed to be done. Each ERP system is likely to treat the AR processes differently. So what are the best practices for streamlining AR function? In today's episode, we invited a panel of cross-functional experts for a live interview on LinkedIn who brings significant expertise to discuss account receivable best practices. We discussed the process boundaries along with different processes that need to be supported by the AR function for different industries. Finally, they shared several stories related to the AR processes and lessons learned from them. With that, Let's get to the conversation. Hello, everyone. Hello. Welcome to today's show. And if you are joining for the first time, this is part of our digital transformation series for which we meet every Thursday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. We pick one topic related to digital transformation. And we always have an expert panel. For today, we are going to be discussing a very deep and interesting topic. Uh, we That is account receivable you know sometimes you might think that account receivable you know it's what could be so hard about account receivable but when you go from industry to industry there are nuances and the best practices so we are going to have a lot of fun discussing all of that uh, before we do that we are going to start with everybody's intros i am going to start with my intro if you don't know me i am sam gupta your host and principal at elevate iq elevate iq is the independent e or b and digital uh, transformation consulting firm and account receivable is always a very interesting topic for us. On that note, I am going to move to Chris for his intro. Thanks, Sam. I'm Chris Garadini, the CEO and owner of Turnkey Technologies. We're a 28-year-old Microsoft Dynamics ERP uh, implementation practice. So receivables is very close to my heart. That's money that people owe me. So let's let's get into that conversation. Exactly. Thank you so much, Chris, for being here. Abu, can I ask you to introduce yourself next? Uh, sure, my name is Abu. Uh, we are Sage X3 partner. We've been in business for the last um, 12 years. You know, we serve a wide variety of industries here in North America. And accounts receivable is something, if you let it go, then, you know, the money coming in suddenly goes down. So it's really important to be on top of that process. It could be a real problem. Thank you so much for being here, Abu. Matt, can I ask you to introduce yourself next? Yeah, I'm Matt Bernat. I'm a lead business analyst with Striven by Miles Technologies. We're an ERP uh, from a full service IT firm, been in business almost 26 years. Uh, AR is our favorite thing because it's one of the places that we've had some of our best success uh, is managing AR when we do implementation. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much for being here, Matt, for the first time, by the way. Nirav, can I ask you to introduce yourself next? Yeah, Nirav Shah. I'm a owner, director, if you will, of AdSers ERP, your premier acumatical partner. Been doing implementations for over 20 years now, and accounts receivable is one that is 
it's easy to say you implement the same way each time, but then probably every third time you'll get a requirement that's a, that's a curveball. And it uh, makes you kind of scratch your head a little bit. So it's a interesting area to talk about. And there's a lot of best practices that come out of those exception type of customers. That is so true. Thank you so much for being here, Narav. Um, all right. So we are going to move with the first question with Chris. But before we do that, if you're in the audience and joining for the first time, make sure you guys post your questions and comments. We typically try to cover them during the show. If you run out of time, our panelists are going to make sure that you receive your answers. <laughs> On that note, I am going to start with the first question, Chris. Uh, so this is going to be really setting up the stage. AR, obviously, you know, AR is very obvious in terms of what is the role of AR. But overall, when you look at the process boundary, system boundaries, how to sort of segment the boundary uh, uh, from the AR perspective, and maybe you can touch the layer of the industry, how different industries uh, use AR that could be beneficial. Chris, over to you. Sure. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, big topic. I mean, it sounds so simple. Accounts receivable. Send you an invoice, you send me a check. Right. We're done. But, you know, as I started like diagramming all the little pieces in an AR process and, you know, most organizations and, and I think size is going to indicate where do you fall and what systems you need in place to help you manage accounts receivable. And to Sam's point, by industry, it varies. And I, I think about even I, the first thing I think is, hey, I, I want to do business with you. Credit and collections, who signs me up? So even before you get a single transaction, there's a credit process. I was like, really? Yeah. We're supposed to check credit before we sign up a customer. And that's a little haha. But the due diligence on credit and vetting somebody before you give them a credit limit, right? Now, what does a credit limit mean? Okay, so even terms, that whole process of signing terms code, yeah. are we doing 2%, 10 net 30? Everybody's like, what's that mean? Well, you get 2% if you pay within 10 days, but otherwise it's net 30. COD, you got to pay me cash. I don't trust you. All right, all front end. So there's a whole front end process and just credit management. Do I have documentations? And oh, I'm going to ask if you're sales tax exempt because that's an early part of the process. But again, let's let's fast forward and we're in the business and we're transacting. What about receivables? Well, great. Now, what's my transaction? Well, what are your payment terms? Do I need money up front? Is it a deposit? Is it a retainer? What are you buying? Services, products, equipment? Is it capital, fixed asset, consumables? So we can get a lot of diversity. And if you think about how the transaction starts and just is there a pre-funding requirement on the transaction? Now, what you're going to hear is a lot of ERP systems are going to behave differently, meaning do they have a credit platform to manage credit, to score people using external services? Where do you keep that data? You move forward, you get into the sales process. Does the sales process know the terms that are established with the customer so that they land on the sales transaction? Somebody booking an order, it knows what to do. Hey, I need to get cash before I can start this. I need a deposit. Can I apply a deposit on a sales order? And now we get into GL. Is it accrued? It's not revenue. It's an accrued. It's an accrual. Oh, now I'm working my balance sheet. I got I got a prepaid and I got a liability. Everybody goes, where do I put those? Well, so the complexity is on the balance sheet management. And again, whether it's a prepayment or retainer that has to be applied at some later point in the process just adds complexity. But um, but again, it could be credit card, could be ACH, EFT. Maybe it's an international needs wire. Is there any foreign exchange? Wow, all these things affect accounts receivable. So we move forward, we sold somebody something. What, what are things that we think about during that process as well? Delivery, completeness of the uh, of the delivery, you know, okay, great, I finished it. Do I email them an invoice? Do I EDI them an invoice? How do they get the invoice? Is it snail mail? I put in the mail to them. Um, again, is there is there some electronic bill pay service they use where, oh, do I get to pull the money? Wow, most people don't like you to pull money out of their account. They'd like to push it to you, but you'd like to pull it. So then you get into ACH, credit card, EFTs, all that stuff. Again, fast forward. Well, let's say you're managing terms customers and you're giving people credit lines and you're managing all this money and you're aging. So then you get into reporting and analytics. So, well, how do I age my receivables? Everybody goes, well, do you age by the invoice date or the due date? Well, you know, it's tricky. Some people want to age by the invoice date, but that assumes that everybody has the same terms. What if you've got net 10, net 30, net 60? They're not all going to be. So you have to age by due date. Hint, hint. Age by due date. And then you're looking, okay, well, who's one day over the due date, right? That's overdue. Everything within that current. So even aging and how you analyze receivables is important, too. Um, and then we fast forward. OK, well, maybe I'm using a third party collection service. Oh, I don't even collect my own AR. So how's that work? I email them the invoice, they email the customer. What do I do to my balance sheet? How much of that cash do I give up? Do I have to discount it to them? How do I track that? Right. Um, I didn't mention collections management. You're doing your own. Do you have a system that does collections versus 
an Excel file or post-it notes all over a Word doc where the owner says, can I see collection activities? And you can't put the notes together with the invoices and the owner can't tell that. So even a tool that does collections, that does your statements, that does note keeping, that builds a documentation trail if you have to go litigate. Litigation is another avenue. We talked about third-party collection services. Best practices, invoice goes out the door, has a cool little link, pay your bill. Well, that's neat. We didn't have that back in the Stone Age. Is what is that, five years ago, 10 years ago? But you young guys, you're like, oh, we've had that since we were born. Anyway, but that technique, you got a link on there, pay my bill. Okay, and then you start heading towards, okay, are they mailing checks? Wow, AR processing. We had a customer that stood up a bill pay site. Great idea. Customers can come online, look at their invoice, look at the detail, reprint it. Sounds great. Customer service, it's huge. Again, is that e-com? Is that a portal? But if you think about the, the customer experience and then one of the pay you bills, what happens now is now I don't have a, a, a cash receipts clerk in the office. In this particular example, this customer had about 57 locations. They had probably 10 ladies. All they did was typed in cash receipts because lots of mail came in the door. Well, they said, hey, we're not going to take mail. We're going to put kiosks out there. We're going to give them a web portal. The customers are going to come online and they're going to push us to cash via an ACH. Great idea. What happened? Volume. Now you think about latency, you think about number of line items on the invoices. These guys are doing 600 million. I think they, they didn't do the sizing right on the portal application because they're trying to sync 10,000 invoices a week with 50,000 line items. Oops. But again, great idea. Portals are great concepts. Customers love the ability to go out there, look at the invoice, print the invoice, push you the cash. You're cutting labor internally. Wow. Sounds like a great, a great process. Again, I can keep going. There are so many little nuances, but now you're hearing which piece do I need? Collections? Do I need ACH? Am I EFTing? Am I? And then we, you know, we didn't even talk about the complexities in prepays and revenue recognition, how it can screw up your balance sheet. Everybody's like, really? It's like, what's the real AR? So there's, you know, I get some nods here because it's truth is, is that real money? Do they really owe me that? If you think about a receivables audit, um, again, a lot of complexity, Sam. I'm going to pause there because I think I used my time a lot. But... No, I mean, you know, this is amazing, to be honest, okay? And and I don't think uh, we were thinking that there are going to be so many different layers of AR. And we have gone from your credit check process, and I don't think I was personally thinking that credit check process needs to be thought through as part of your AR process, so that's brilliant. Then you have terms there. Then you have sales tax management, which is amazing. And then obviously, aging and dunning is going to be super cool as well. And uh, litigation, that's brilliant. I don't know uh, how many people are really thinking about litigation as part of the AR process, uh, but you know, people need to understand that as well. The really the interesting thing that I liked in your conversation is your story. Okay. So in terms of the volume, and I don't know if people followed the story, so maybe you want to provide sure, a little bit more colors there. Uh, sure. You know, so 600,000 were... Oh, they're about $600 million company. They had 57 locations. So they high volume of transactions. And again, they had 10 clerks doing cash receipting. Yeah. Okay. Everybody's mailing checks from all over the U.S. to one location. So I think the, the, the vision was, let's push it out. And again, even having a kiosk in the... Uh, and they have a retail... Um, retail locations and uh, they have kiosks and people could make payments. Brilliant idea. And then the web-based portal. And I think the, the, the real constraint was just as they had an on-premise, <coughs> legacy on-premise ERP system. I, I think they're still working to, to upgrade that. But uh, the point was the volume of, of transactions to sync between their on-premise system in the um, in the cloud-based applications, I think they just had a bottleneck due to volume, and um, and it wasn't sized correctly. Again, even the on-premise SQL servers and looking at how they were where they were hosting the application. Again, this has probably been about three or four years ago that the endeavor. But the premise was we're going to reduce the staff from from ten to two people. Oh, wow, that's substantial. You think at eight clerks making fifty grand a year, there's a four hundred thousand dollar ROI. You you improve the customer service component of it. But it is it is the portal experience is a, is a great piece to have. Um, we've looked at vendors that can stand up portals for customers these days pretty easily in the web where they're just doing that. They're syncing the ERP data. They're taking up. They're taking a percentage of it. So, again, factoring receivables as part of that that backside. You know, do you pay money to a litigator? Do you pay money to a collection firm? But uh, but again, in this case, the, the portal really added some customer service for this particular client. So okay, amazing insights there. Thank you so much, Chris. So, Abu, I'm actually coming to you. And the problem with 
Chris being on the panel is always going to be that you are probably going to run out of ideas that, okay, now what do I talk? Because he has already spoken about everything on the air, right? But as far as I know, Abu, he is going to bring a very unique insight here in terms of the air. So, you know, so Abu, I'm, I'm actually looking for uh, any sort of insights, especially from the industry perspective, overall from the context perspective, as far as the AR process yeah. goes. Oh, I think we lost him. So I think he's going to come back. So I'm actually going to come to Matt. So Matt, now, uh, you know, since you are joining for the first time, right? Uh, and you know uh, how competitive these panels are. So I don't know, you know, uh, if you have any sort of colors that you might be able to add overall from the AR process perspective, any specific experiences or stories that you might have uh, from the industries that you have worked in. Do you want to uh, provide your insights, please? Absolutely. So we're an industry non-specific ERP. We'll work with anybody. And I think that has led to some other insights where sometimes you just solve a problem with, hey, this is how another industry is doing it. And that could be for any part of the system. But when you talk about AR, one of our biggest successes was with a company that um, the biggest thing that we, they found out that their issue was, was communication. They had all of these disparate systems that were trying to communicate what the AR was that it wasn't that their clients didn't want to pay them or were delaying in paying them. It's that nobody knew what to pay. So they would provide these services and it was a, it's a pure service-based business, but they provide all the services and then nobody knew what to pay. They were on our system for about six months. They had left a different ERP software for hours. Uh, not only did was our software cheaper, I think they paid about half of their initial cost. They, in six months, decreased their collections by over 80% on ours. Why? It was one streamlined platform. We had a payment profile, a payment portal, so people could go in, put a portal in. We actually, in our payment portal, allow for auto pay. So when you're on Striven, you can set your customers up with auto pay. They can sign up for it affirmatively and get the notification that it's like, hey, you got to pay. Decreased collections by 82%. Why? One stop shop and with everything in one area, all integrated, the data was always out in real time. So if something did slip and needed to be collected on, they did have a workflow for that in our system, completely based out of one system with the minimalist amount of connections possible. The only connections we had were an online banking feed and their uh, payment gateway. Those were the only thing. By streamlining the process, you have the minimalist amount of touch points, which means the most transparent data, which also means knowing where you're at when it comes to AR. So that's what we pride ourselves in because again, at the end of the day, AR is cash flow. If you don't have the cash, you can't do the next investment. And for a service-based business, that could be as simple as paying their employees. You've got to pay out commissions on the services you provide if that's the route you go. But for goods-based businesses, you can't acquire the next batch of the thing that you're going to make. So for our manufacturers, once you run a batch of something, whatever that something is, you got to buy your next set of raw materials to make your next batch. Otherwise, you can't sell anything. So getting that cash flow in is really important. Uh, and that's why we focus on that part in our ERP, because having the cash on hand, means you can go out and go quicker to the next thing, which allows you to increase your business and grow. And if you're looking to grow and scale, you got to have the money on hand to do those initial investments. It pays for itself pretty quickly. Okay, some amazing layers there. And by the way, I mean, I completely agree with you that AR is, uh, you know, cash flow. And uh, a lot of my friends here, Abu and Chris, might be missing uh, Aaron Spool. And he typically talks about that when you are going to have your KPIs that are going to be revenue based, that's not a real KPI because, you know, if you cannot collect the cash, it doesn't make a you know ton of sense. So that's why he always emphasizes on having those cash flow centric um, KPIs. So Matt, uh, the follow up question I'm going to have for you is going to be, do you have any stories that you might be able to share from your experience working in different industries and differences in the AR processes that you have seen? Absolutely. So, you know, I, I, it's so tough when you follow Chris because he does nail 90% of the scenarios. But the one that we had, uh, the one that I just mentioned to start with, you know, the company that came to us, their issue, they build by the project. So the, it wasn't hourly based billing, but I'm going to talk about that in a second. So they would help, their business is helping other businesses incorporate. They are a business registration company. They get you set up, certified, and out and running. They came to us because the biggest issue is every time they'd file a certification with a different state government, different local government, different federal government, they would charge the filing fee plus a little something, but they would do all the work. So when you're doing this project-based billing, you're accruing, everything is at cost plus a margin, and that margin is decided based on whatever formulas they use. That's actually very easy. You calculate it. Not all that difficult. So you had the rules in, you put it in there. But to generate the proper AR, they had to know, well, do we invoice in bulk? Are we going to invoice every time we do a filing? So there's a lot of determinations about when do you invoice that are really important. 
do you build progress? Do you build all up front, all on approval, all on completion of the work that you do? AR isn't just everything that Chris said about managing cash flow, but it's also when do you want it? Because there's bonus, there, there's benefits to having things delayed out depending on tax periods. Maybe you want to accrue your accounting in a certain way. Again, then it gets into the liability and liability tracking, which with us and how we do our AR in our system, you can post an entry off the income right to that liability account. There's actual ways to set that in our system. We have that so that you can do the line item on the actual invoice. For a, a sales rep who's entering something, they could say, yeah, my invoice is a deposit. Well, a deposit isn't hitting an income account. It's hitting that liability so that the second you want to move it over and pay it off, it's generating that paid liability. Now, we're in, again, we're in a GL, but doing that is all important because it is all encompassing. So the AR portion should always be managed with that in mind. So going back to my one client you know, that we worked with, we're implementing an ERP and the whole point is everything is tied to a payable. And the payable is always those filings. So they file with these different government agencies. They get the permits. They get everything that's needed, licensures, whatever. And all of these things are then marked up and sent back, plus there's some project admin fees. So the calculations are key when you're doing that kind of work because you have to pull it in, calculate it, generate the AR, but then also generate the corresponding payable because you're collecting on money that you're actually passing through to pay somebody else with. So very important to manage that and be able to mark when something comes in how that works. This company, as I said, the biggest turn was in six months on our system, they reduced their collections by over 80%. That meant more cash flow, more cash in their pocket, and it was our system. The other hidden benefit was that our ERP happened to cost half of what they were already paying. So they're, they had this other essentially cash flow of, hey, we got a better system that does more inside of one system with fewer touch points and cost less. That's just an even bigger return on the investment that they had. Okay, amazing insights there. Thank you so much, Matt, for that. So Abu, uh, I don't know if you're back. I mean, I would love to hear your insights, uh, you know, in terms of the layers overall from the AR context, as well as if you have any layers for you, the industry. You, you put so much pressure on me last time, Sam, that my system just collapsed. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Too much pressure on the internet, I guess. <laughs> Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, Chris had, you know, you know, he talked a lot about the front end, you know, some very interesting points, and I listened to half of Matt's conversation. I think one thing that gets missed is sometimes it can be really complicated just to create an invoice, right? Uh, you know, I, we have run into companies where it would take three weeks just to create the invoice to the customer. I mean, even in our industry, we are software industry. Um, you know, we're doing projects, you know, we, somebody has to look at the hours, do the hours make sense, for example, you know, how much can we reasonably bill to the client, you know, how much is our own internal issues, for example, right, and has to undergo that approval process. So somebody has to log the hours, somebody has to approve the hours, somebody has to, you know, see them, how it relates to the contract and then bill it out. Um, so it's all of those complexities. If you're in a project, if you're in industrial manufacturing and you're working on milestone payments, for example, so what is a milestone, right? So even if it's written in a contract, are uh, you actually at that milestone? Sometimes that can be tough to say, right? So you're undergoing a design process, for example, and you're saying, you know, when at the end of design completion, I'm going to charge you this much, but you know, design is ne often never completed, right? It, when is it good enough to charge to the end customer, right? And then it has to be approved by your manager, project director, and then you know the billing person has to understand it, you know, when to invoice it out. All of those things create a lot of complexity, uh, you know, in creating that invoice and sending it out to the customer. Uh, again, in a lot of these industries, you know, you have to attach backup documents. You know, just collecting all those backup documents so that they are ready to be packaged with an invoice can, you know, take a huge amount of effort. So it's all those factors. It's creating the invoice, uh, which is also extremely important part of the process, which we oftentimes do not keep an eye on. So, you know, I've seen customers where they forget to invoice. <laughs> so, you know, that also happens, right? So we were in the oil and gas industry back in the 2008s. And, you know, people forgot to invoice. They were making so much money <laughs> that they forgot to invoice. So, and that's possible, right? So it's all those control factors that have to come in, uh, in depending on the kind of industry you are in. 
uh, in your account receivable process as well. Okay, so amazing layers there always, uh, Abu. And, uh, you know, Alan's Fool is probably going to get the shout out again because, uh, you know, he always talks about you are walking in your office floor and all of a sudden you are finding a piece of paper and then you are unwrapping that and figuring out, okay, what the hell is this? And then you figure out, okay, that's actually your invoice sitting on a piece of paper and that's not accounted anyway. <laughs> okay, so that's the real story of, uh, you know, these invoices that not only you are going to forget, but you are going to find in your junkyard. So, you know, make sure you have your AR uh, processes figured out. The other layer that you mentioned is very interesting. Um, you mentioned two things. Number one, the milestone payments. I think there are a lot of different layers there. And I especially loved your comment about the design process. So I am actually looking to get some more insights there from your perspective, because, you know, as the ERP consultant for us, this is a major challenge. Uh, mm -hmm. When you say, okay, you have implemented an ERP, okay, sometimes that could mean a lot of different things. Okay, well, sometimes, you know, because you are delivering your virtual uh, code, uh, some people are going to implement just the accounting and sometimes, you know, that's going to be everything. So I don't know how you define that milestone. So Abu, ha ha have you seen any sort of best practices overall in defining the milestone and making sure the commitment is going to be aligned between the party who's seeking the services versus the service provider? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so it's important to, you know, assign the milestones and what each milestone means, right? Yeah. From our perspective, you know, as I said, a design process, you know, when you're designing new business processes, there's always going to be some questions, right? So you have to be able to set that reasonable expectation where, you know, 90, 95% of the mapping of the process is design, is design is done, then it's due for invoicing, right? So again, you know, in order to avoid disputes, you know, then you have to get sign off on the design process with some exceptions in there, right? So that the expectation is now set that the next invoice is coming in. And similarly, again, you know, what is build? What, what do you mean by when build is done, right? So build is done when, you know, we have made the system available for testing, for example, right? So again, you know, how much of build is done? You know, as you know, you can never completely build the system, right? It's extremely hard. So, it, you know, a lot of times it's also a judgment, you know, the, the project manager has to judge, you know, is the client happy? Does he think it's enough? You know, it's not always just about the contract also, right? Contract at the end is a piece of paper. If the client's not happy or there's no, you know, sometimes they let the contract go and sometimes they're going to become very anal about it, right? So in this kind of industry, it also becomes a judgment call when to invoice or when we are ready to invoice as well, right? So that's, um, you know, so you have to be on top of it. You have to be on top of the relationship. You have to get the sign off. And, you know, you, that's, that, that's what I would say, you know, getting those sign offs at each milestone, which will prevent you from going to litigation or making litigation easier if you have to go into it. Yeah, could not agree more. And I don't think you can solve everything by your contract uh, mm -hmm. and with the legal terms. You have to have your relationship. That's why relationships are really important. Thank you so much. Uh, Abu, that. So, Nirav, I'm actually coming to you. So, obviously, you know, the problem in going last is that, you know, everybody has spoken pretty much everything related to AR. So, okay, so I don't know if you're going to have any sort of unique colors that you might be able to provide overall yeah. from the process perspective and any specific scenarios that you have seen uh, in the industries that you have worked in where AR specific challenges were there. Over to you. Yeah, no, everybody before me has done a great job. I mean, the, the insights there were just phenomenal. Um, a lot to unpack with everybody that, that talk, that's talked already so far. So excellent work there. There are a few things that I could add, not much, but there's a few things I could add uh, in, in, in my contribution to our conversation today. And one is, you know, going with Chris's theme a little bit, um, is what, what additional work can we do more upfront, right, to make sure the AR process is running smoother? Okay, so what I mean by that is, what about the relationship between where the PO is coming from and where the invoice is going, right? Sometimes that relationship, right, is not set up front. So now when you're about to invoice, go into a boost point, right? It takes a little bit longer time because you don't have the right billing addresses that you're, that you're invoicing to, right? You don't know who you're invoicing to. So really straightening that out up front, right, along with payment terms and credit limits, where is this invoicing going? Because once you know that, right, that's, again, half the battle. So the invoice is going to go to the right place. You know, it's going to be distributed, you know, aged and then paid in a timely manner, right? Um, I had a customer, for example, where they always had their PO address and the billing address is always the same. But they processed probably 150 to 200 invoices a day in terms of payments from their invoices that uh, essentially 
those invoices were coming from different builders and they had they never knew where the building address was coming from what building location was going to pay it because they they were a manufacturing rep for uh you know honeywell and 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 they, they had all different places that they were collecting their invoices for from the end customer perspective right so that was a challenge for them and once we sorted out how to consolidate how to how to get those building locations linked back to the proper PO locations, it made the job of collecting cash, offsetting the invoice much easier uh, for them without having to worry that was the uh, building locations already there? Was the proper location built, right? Or not built? So being able to select that was, was and being, being able to organize that against the customer was very, 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 very critical, right? Um, another thing that I also th- I see a lot of is customers, don't really sometimes look at what is the cost of generating an invoice or what is the cost of processing a receivable, right? Uh, Because there is a cost, right? There's a cost benefit of doing transactions uh, in the system, right? The cost has to outweigh, right? The benefit has to outweigh the cost essentially and everything we're doing in the ERP system. So a lot of customers, right? They'll they'll go ahead and take, you know, they'll they'll generate invoices, they'll get payments for it, and they'll do hundreds of invoices. Well, if you just take a step back and say, well, how could we, consolidate invoices how could we instead of us having you know low dollar high volume invoices well we have a, you know low volume number of invoices but high dollar invoices right so we concentrate on that we're chasing higher dollar invoices how could we get our, our our customers to consolidate a little more in terms of how they're ordering to us essentially so we are reducing the burden in our ar department right how do we do that how do we do that effectively in the system right how do we look at their buying patterns essentially from us, right? How can we add value, right? And this, that's adding value, not only through AR, that's adding value through just business process efficiency um, uh, through your business, right? Uh, so that's another thing. I, I find that, you know, that gets overlooked a lot of times in the AR process. Let's just do what we're doing. But how could we make it more efficient? And that starts with change. Um, and let's change the process so we could make a better process, not only for us, but our customers too. We're not we're not we're not fighting or, or, or running after dollar amounts. We're running after bigger size invoices, right? That makes more sense for us, essentially. Um, also, instituting finance charges or reminders or statements, right? How are we doing that uh, in the ERP system? How often are we doing that? Is that going to increase our collection if we just issue statements potentially, right, to our customers? Um, what information do we want to show on our statements? On the other side of AR, you have credits. How much credits are sitting out there that haven't been applied? to invoices for customers, right? A lot of times credits will just be floating out there in, 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 in the customer record, right? But never really applied. Customer never pays invoices because they think that, oh, the credit's being applied, but you're sending invoices to a customer. How's this being, how's this being reconciled at the end of the day, right? These are all true challenges that companies face on a day-to-day basis from looking at and, and reconciling their accounts receivable activity in the system. So, you know, all these things make, you know, are important also from the standpoint of collection. Let's collect efficiently. Let's, let's make sure our team is spending the right amount of time that they are having conversations with customers, not being debt collectors per se, but they're saying, hey, Mr. Customer, you know, uh, this, this popped up on our, uh, on our, on our report. All, you know, you, this is like maybe 10 days, you know, 10 days past due. What can I do to help expedite the payment, right? Something along those lines, right? Versus calling customers saying, hey, there's three months of invoices that haven't been paid. Essentially, so you know, how could we make that process more efficient and not just look at standard AR processing, but you know, look at the next, you know, the next version of AR. How could we make our business better by starting at the at the AR side? So some very interesting layers there. And by the way, it does not feel like this is your first time. There, so good job there. <laughs> you know, some very unique layers. Uh, one of the things that I especially like here um, is going to be the whole cost of invoicing that. Uh, you mentioned, and you know, this is my personal commitment to the community. Now people are going to get a lot of shout out. So basically, if you are going to be telling me any specific story, then I am going to be shouting them out a lot. So Chris, this is for you. Uh, you know, the guy is Peter Jokel, turn on dynamics from the Microsoft ecosystem. Okay, and guys connect with him, follow him on LinkedIn. And what he talks about is this whole KPI. I think they have a tool that they have developed. And the tool, what it does is basically uh, it tracks the KPI uh, more from the cost of invoicing. Uh, and I don't know if any ERP systems really do that, to be honest, because that is more of the operational KPI as opposed to your business KPI. So I really like the way you have presented that, you know, you probably need to monitor the cost, but I don't know if there are many systems out there that can really measure 
the cost of invoicing, cost of AR, cost of AP, I don't know. So that's a very interesting layer there. Thank you so much. The clarification that I would like from you is going to be, uh, when you were telling your story, by the way, that was really interesting, okay? So when you are saying, okay, you get PO from one location and then invoice to another location, what happens there? So basically, let me see, the way I could gather is, okay, you probably have a different address there, you know, overall in the story. So is it really the system problem, process problem? What was going on there? Do you have some more clarification? Maybe yeah, it, example of the business? Yeah, it, it was it was both actually. There was a system system limitation there that the system didn't allow you to collect cash from a billing uh, location that wasn't assigned to the invoice already, right? Um, because it's trying to take the defaults. How they because once usually on a gap compliance system, once the invoice is done, there's very little you could change from it. So that was an issue. Then they, from the customer standpoint, they just didn't do their due diligence. They didn't give time to organize that customer. You know, and who, which which entity could ultimately needs to receive in that invoice? They just kind of, you know, took a generic PO that was probably written in like, you know, a napkin, and uh, they went ahead and fulfilled the order and just went ahead and invoiced. Essentially, now the cash came in, they're happy about, it, but they could never apply it, right? They'd have to go around the system, maybe do journal entries to put in cash in the system, but now you have this old, you know, backlog of aging that's sitting there that's not even relevant anymore. Right. So organizing the customer, making sure your customers are organized. So when you create the invoice, when you create the sales order, you're invoicing to the correct location. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much for those insights. Now, really appreciate it. So, Chris, I'm actually coming back to you. So I don't know if you are going to have any sort of comments over comments. So, you know, this segment is my favorite and my personal favorite segment is always going to be if you can do story over the story. Oh, I got some oh, and, I, and I didn't use the whole list, guys. I was waiting to see if you guys would figure out what I didn't add on there. So let's. So I got a whole bunch of. Here's a great one: dispute resolution. Oh my gosh! You mentioned disputes, but just the whole managing dispute resolution. And as we get into the industry caveat, when you're dealing with the big back, big box guys, there's this thing called chargeback processing. Like OMG, talk about complicating receivables life, right? You sent them an invoice. Oh, but you violated a rule. We're going to charge you a dime. And then there's another 12 cents interest on the dime and, you know, tracking all the debits and credits and reconciling. It's a nightmare. So if you think about that scenario, there's actually modules you can drop. And I don't know if Acumatic or you guys have a standard dispute or chargeback processing, but it's typically EDI related big box guys, but there's an industry play that really complicates your AR. So there's one you guys missed. And then, uh, you know, just overall adjustments processing. And you think about the business processes related to adjustments and approvals. And well, where are you booking those entries? Because like in a professional services, are they building adjustments? Are they rate adjustments? Do they impact, impact the workers' productivity? So there's a whole set of ramifications around adjustments processing. And again, in that dispute resolution, you get you tail into your master service agreement with your client, or your customers. What are the terms for dispute resolution? Meaning, is he going to sue me? Can he sue me? We agree not to sue each other. So that's a whole other set of caveats. You guys missed that one too. But in one other, a rather neat one is now you get into the, the custom billing for customers where you personalize the experience. And, you know, Narav, you mentioned it a little bit about consolidated invoicing. Consolidated invoicing is, I don't know if you were doing it for the customer, you're doing it more for the company, but there is a, there is a, a customer facing billing modifications that you do. And if you think about the problem, if you stand in the customer's shoe, they get your invoice and what happens to it? There's three or four people represented on it. How do I get it approved? Well, most of them aren't using POs where there's four POs and you send them one invoice with five lines and four POs and they're, they don't know how to handle it. So then the custom one comes in where you actually send back their allocation detail where, Hey, guess what? My line items on my invoice have your departments to make it real easy to code so you can pay me faster. So that is an interesting caveat. A lot of people don't think about is where's the bottleneck on them getting it into their system? Here, wait, wait, let me give it to you electronically. Maybe not an EDI, but you're doing so much volume, you know, it's the old 80-20 rule. If 20% of your customers, maybe you help them and they. Why? Because you accelerate the process. Because if coding's a bottleneck, think about those types of things. Um, And I threw out the reconciliation because I have have a story that personal experience, and I just was like, really? This is, you know, (laughs) so imagine project-centric, right? Hey, I'm going to send you five invoices for 20% retainers. Boom, 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 boom equals 100% of the project. But meanwhile, the accounting ta- staff is taking these retainer invoices and generating periodic invoices and applying the cash. Yeah. And then when they send you a statement, it's got these five 20 percenters and everything else. And you know what? It doesn't add up to what I owe. How's a customer supposed to figure out what they owe you? There's a perfect example where you get into projects and prepayments and retainer applications. And, you know, and the problem is the accounting departments, it's just like the, the customer billing. You send it to them and they're like, and guess what happens? Nothing. So if you wonder why your AR is clogging up, ask yourself. 
you know, and I, I looked at this stuff and I said, you serious? You send this to a customer? I'm like, no wonder. They don't know what they don't know what they owe you. How could they tell? This is this is twice as much as I thought I owed you. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So, again, this and it, you guys mentioned communication. Communication is imperative. You know, and Rob, you said get it right on the front end. Get the right addresses. You're right. Yeah. Billing. But again, I think people need to step back and look at what they're sending to the customers. And just yeah. Ask them. Yeah. Oh, oh, Did you yeah. figure this out? Because that experience is really, and, and again, it, it creates the problem. I think that's a lot of it. You know, delivery. Did we deliver? Did I get a sign off? Read, you know, you need your verification that you delivered services, whether those are, and again, in the, in the project delivery, we have a very powerful PMO and the PMO helps us keep accountability and documentation to support you know, we had somebody ask for their money back and I'm like, I'm sorry, you paid all the invoices <laughs> for the MSA. It says that you paid all the invoices condition of satisfaction, you know, yeah, so we have yeah. a real problem with giving money back where somebody said it was OK. We paid for it. But two years later, can I have all my money? back? So, yeah. yeah. Terms yeah. and conditions. Again, as we've heard that from a few folks. So just yeah. throwing more conjecture in there. And I think that there's one more I, did, I had on the list here didn't talk about is what is AR? Is it build or unbuild? When do I start? tracking this stuff on my balance sheet, right? Where is that AR? I got cash. I got all this work in process, yeah. but is it material whip? What if it's services whip? I think there's a whole nother conversation about what is AR and when do I start tracking AR or when do I start looking at the age of this? Because frankly, if you know, I have a, I have a group, a large professional services firm, you know, they're billing three, 400,000 hours a year. Yeah. So, you know, their dashboard is what's an AR, how old is that? And what's unbilled? But if you look at months old, unbilled whip, AKA unbuild AR, yeah. you got a receivables problem before it even goes out the door. So I'm yeah. just, most people don't look at that. They're looking at what did I invoice? Let's talk about what's in the pipeline. And in a manufacturing whip, that's different whip than what we're talking about services whip, where you actually have earned value against the contract. And maybe you didn't do your rev rec, maybe you didn't do your invoicing. But mm-hmm. again, some mm-hmm. people aren't carrying that on their balance sheet. Why? They're like, well, because then I have to do unearned revenue. Do I want to put earned revenue on the PL or do I have an unbuild AR or, or you know, and that's, yep. that's it. You got to put both entries. You can't put one or the other, but so those are business decisions. And again, all we're doing is creating more transparency into what's that, what's that real balance sheet worth as opposed to just having it off the book. But anyway. yeah, absolutely. Also, also kind of relates back to the cash flow statement, right? Uh, how are you looking at that? Right. Uh, based on your, you know, your projects or your, you know, your whip out there, because you know, it should include that essentially, but I have to have visibility of that information. That's going to be coming through your ERP system. You have good visibility of that. You can pull that information out. Um, just adding a few more things onto that, Chris. Um, intercompany AR. Uh, that 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 that's another interesting one, right? A lot of companies, you know, handle that. I've seen that handle it a few strange ways, right? But you gotta you gotta be able to handle that properly. Eliminate and uh, you know allow that from an arm's length transaction. At the end of the day, uh, what about multi currency? When you have when you do AR and multi multiple currencies, ultimately, how are you reporting on that? How's that being aged? How are you translating that multi? You talk about revaluation. You revaluation. said aging. How about revaluation? Oh, Absolutely. wait a minute. You mean my AR is not the same today as it was exactly. yesterday? Exactly. Yeah. They paid me short, or did they pay me over? Do the math, yeah, right? Exa- exactly. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's Absolutely. Complex. It is very, very important. You can do that right the first time, and you know, gotta give it some thought, and you can do it properly in the ERP system. All right, guys. Amazing insights there. Thank you so much, Chris uh, and Nirav, uh, for uh, those comments. So, uh, Abu, I'm actually coming to you. Uh, any comments over comments or stories over stories? Uh, Abu, if you're speaking, you are on mute. Sorry, <laughs> technology problems today. <laughs> yeah, too many problems today. I mean, I mean, the biggest problem is that you know we have found is collecting the AR. You know, the, the ability to invoice out. Uh, you know, intercompany AR. You know, they are brought out a very interesting thing, right? How do you value the pricing transaction, right? It's supposed to be at fair market value when you sell between companies, but a lot of companies, you know, do intercompany invoicing very differently. Uh, then keeping on track of elimination. A lot of systems cannot handle that multi-company AR. Uh, that becomes a problem. The other thing that often comes in is, you know, billing charges on the invoice. You know, there's always, you know, banks deducted fees, there are broker fees and all of that. But, you know, interesting one project that we did, you know, which was interesting was that it was taking one month for the customer to invoice the data out because their, their delivery system was handled by third-party systems and then they had to, you know, they had to wait for information to come from the third party. They had to combine it. They had to check it. And then they had to approve the process, right? So, you know, I think Nirav or Chris talked about your AR. Nobody knew what their actual AR was because the third party was serving the, the product from the warehouse and then giving them the data three days, four days later. And then another couple of weeks to invoice and collate it all together. So, 
nobody really knew how much we sold, right? So all somebody's, you know, sales reps are giving you estimates. You have an idea, but you have no exact value. You know how much is unbuilt right now. So implementing those systems around, you know, you have shipped the product, but not invoiced is also very important, right? So, you know, in the distribution slash manufacturing world, you call it ship, not invoice. And then reconciling that ship, not invoice account to the actual AR, that becomes oftentimes a problem as well. So we did this big project for one of our companies where, you know, the third party had 30 outsourced distribution locations that will actually ship the product. And, you know, in back in 2008 and nine, they're actually setting out handwritten copies of the paper, right? And they'd make a spelling mistake in the customer name and the system would just air it out, right? <laughs> so we ended up developing systems which would recognize the spelling mistakes, combining all the data, you know, putting in the approval processes, notifications, alerts. So to bring that down to invoice from like four weeks to, you know, like four or five days. So, um, you know, so, you know, sometimes it can be seen simple, you know, let's go out and invoice, but as soon as you are in the manufacturing milestone based, you know, complex distribution industry, the time to invoice starts becoming really long and long and long. And you almost need, you know, real executive oversight to make sure that you're building it, right? Especially if you're a larger company and you have smaller projects going on, sometimes you do not even have the visibility right to the top, how many contracts are out there, right? So to keep having the systems and processes in place to make sure that you are invoicing what you have to invoice on time can become a big challenge. Okay, amazing insights there. Thank you so much, Abu, for that. So Matt, I'm actually coming to you. Uh, any comments over comments, stories over stories? So there's something that I wanted to touch on that Nirav said that I think is very important and is entirely overlooked to the point that like, even I realize I, I don't even think of it. And I actually have a background in it in my own right, which is the cost of doing business. I used to work for a bank. I'm a former banker before I got into the ERP stage. So I've worked as a, you know with a bank that did merchant services. They charge you the swipe of the credit card per transaction. So it is in your best interest if you're invoicing. I'm just going to throw out numbers here that are made up. But if you're invoicing a $100,000 product and you're invoicing it 10 times, $10,000 each, you're actually not going to get as much as if you did one invoice for the full 100000 just like a single check. Now, of course, obviously, you know nobody wants to pay out that 100000 at once. It's a lot harder for their cash flow on the other side. So you have to find that happy medium of being able to do that. I'm actually like kind of like kicking myself here that I didn't think of that because I come from that background. I helped on that side when I did that before I got into the ERP space. Very important to know that to manage that. The other thing that comes out of it is keep the CRM portion of your ERP updated because again, the location billing, if you don't know how to do that, how to create an invoice, you can't create a proper invoice, which means you can't get paid the right amount. I would venture, and this is just me speculating with the implementations that I've done, that when I come in, the biggest thing I see is inefficiency and the lost time is one of the biggest lost causes of profitability on a whole. And creating invoices is a big deal to be able to do that because you can't get paid. But also the time, the more efficient you make the process, the less internal man hours. One of the things that we did as a company and we do is that in order to make creating an invoice easier for our customers, when you implement with us, our implementations are actually fixed cost. We have fixed them by scope of work. So everything in the scope of work has a value assigned to it. That value, regardless of the time it takes, is fixed price billing. So when you say, I want this, 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 and this, we say, boom, 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 and boom, that costs X number of dollars. Here's your invoice, Mr. Customer. We'll get started on the work. We have a, we have a due date scheduled for this day. And we don't bill by the hour. Why? Because that means we can invoice right up front, get our payment, we don't have to worry now about collecting unless we don't get paid. So we'll start work once the payment's received and it's good, but everything's transparently agreed on. So there's not an issue of that. Creates an invoice very easily. Um, in the manufacturing space for our manufacturing customers, and we do have a bunch, the biggest thing there for us with the PO process is the ability is how we do intakes. And we have the ability to do them in multiple different ways but we keep everything organized in the system. So if you do a multi-PO from your client with a single invoice, you can link them all up and you can line item them out. Would love to do the idea and I'm going to steal it. And I can't remember who said it about like, hey, let's let's throw your internal cost codes on there as well if we do that. I think that was the Rob, but I could be wrong. Um, it, it's a great idea. And I think that's like the next generation because if you generate the efficiency, that time that you regain is again, its own set of income and its own ability to invest further and improve your process. And functionally speaking, the AR, the tangible, 
is getting paid faster, collecting, using my example of a $100,000 invoice, collecting that $100,000, but also your cost of labor on it. You cut out the, the uh, AR staff, you cut out collections because you get it. That's just more money in your own pocket to reinvest in your business. Okay, amazing insights there. Thank you so much, Mesh, for that. Nirav, I'm actually coming to you. Comments over comments, stories over stories. Yeah, no, I think, uh, you know, we're all hitting it, you know, basically right nail, the nail right on the head, but, you know, just focusing a little bit on credit card. Um, you know, e-commerce, uh, distribution, or retail companies, right? That's huge for them, right? AR is very little, uh, but they still have AR. Right, they they need a good payment processor. They're getting orders from the e-commerce site. They're cre we're creating an invoice essentially. They're paying it right away. But what's that credit card doing essentially? That credit card's only being authorized, right? It's not actually being fully settled until you ship. So that 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 the whole record between invoice and credit card charge have to has to stay together, right? Uh, properly in order for that once that shipment happens, then that then that funds have to be released, and then that invoice automatically has to be generated, and that invoice has to be offset. That's a very delicate process, right? You need a good system to handle that, uh, in a sense. It's part of the AR department, it's part of the AR process, but a lot of it happens behind the scenes, right, if it's done correctly. So it's important, you know, to look at credit cards, if that there's a way to leverage credit cards, to take credit card up front on an order. So when that order comes in and the order gets taken and then the order gets shipped, there's very little AR in that process, right? It essentially, because as soon as the invoice happens, it gets offset by the credit card charge, which is essentially settled, uh, basically. So I think credit card is huge. If you have trucks out on the field, right? If you own trucks and you're a truck driver, for example, I had a distribution company there in the, in the wine industry. They, the truck driver actually went out, did the delivery, created the invoice and collected the, collected the cash, right? How do you manage it? How do you get tools and technology in that truck driver's hand to be able to do these do this transaction very efficiently, and that's where you have a product. For example, Acumatica has a great um, mobile application for their solution, right? They could go ahead, take product that's probably on this truck already, go ahead and ship it once it hit the dot, once it hits the particular wholesaler, and invoice it, print the invoice electronically, send the invoice off to the customer, and collect cash and, and submit cash directly all through the handheld device, right? Essentially, it's a native mobile app, right? Uh, so that's also a touch point, right? If you have, if companies have trucks where they, you know, want to be able to have those truck drivers be able to be a little bit more mobile and 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 do a lot of these AR uh, activities, you know, we need to find solutions for that. Okay, amazing insights there. And, uh, you know, I am going to do, uh, you know, some things differently here. I'm actually going to open up the floor because we don't have enough time to go uh, with everyone right now. So the question that my favorite topic again, Chris, uh, you know, is going to be the architecture. And when you look at different systems, uh, obviously some systems are going to accommodate everything in one go, then you probably don't have to worry about it. But, you know, most businesses are probably going to be utilizing multiple systems in general. Uh, you know, it could be ERP, CRM, then you have a little AR portal. Sometimes that's going to be provided by your ERP. Uh, then you have your EDI. Uh, I guess Chris already mentioned that. What else am I missing here? E-commerce, uh, exactly. big boy, okay? Yeah. <laughs> because they want to have invoices inside yeah. them, okay? They don't want to lose control of those invoices. So I can see a little dance there, you know, when you are going to be doing the process, who's going to be storing the customer, who's going to be sending the invoices, who is the source of authority for the invoices? Open floor, guys, comments. So my recommendation there is you have to, when you do your architecture of your systems, do it in a way that you have a hierarchy. One system should be the system of record. And if there's a discrepancy, you start with that top system and you say, this is the one that we know is right. And you update everything else accordingly. Get systems. If you are going to go multiples that have good APIs with each other, make sure you audit all the security on them. You need to have a plan for if something goes wrong. Um, I think disaster planning is what, you know, it's something that's very important there because you don't know what goes wrong until it's broken. But if you have a plan to fix it or you have that backup of some capacity, you just work through your backups until you have the information ready to go and keep and kept updated uh, in that regard. Okay. Yeah, I was, uh, yeah, yeah don't I was, lose your AR data because people aren't going to call you and tell you that you owe them or they owe you money. AP yeah. data, meaning you owe people money, they'll call you. But the receivables, yeah. make sure you keep, to Matt's point, a great backup. Sam, I sent you a message. I'm like running out of battery. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Chris, no problem at all. Now, you have a comment? Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll say leverage as many cloud solutions as you can. 
you know, I think I think that's an important point. You know, a lot of companies they'll create their infrastructure strategy with outdated systems. You know, they'll they'll have like an old on-premise ERP system potentially. Then they'll have, you know, then they're all of a sudden doing some r- real awesome work on eBay, Amazon, you know, Etsy, Shopify, and and then and then now they want to you know have like this amazing EDI solution that. Um, you know, wants to feed around, but it, it doesn't really support really well. Yeah, it could work, but it, I, I would say, you know, definitely focus on, you know, get all the systems uplifted at the same time to create that right architecture that you're going to be, be able to sustain your AR processes, but more than that, your business long term. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to say, I mean, there are two levels of AR processes, right? One are the external facing, so sending the invoice, collecting the information, where to send invoice, all of that, and then there's the internal how to actually create the data to send the invoice. And sometimes, you know, depending on the industry, if you are doing business at Walmart, for example, and Costco and any other big box store, you cannot dictate your terms to them, right? You have to do what they say. You have to follow their system. So sometimes, you know, you have to look at, you know, okay, you're designing the AR system can become very complex because you you know, you're, you know, Costco, Walmart, you know, they're a segment of their own uh, often, right? So. So really, you have to look at your own business. You have to have a holistic view, in internal process, external process, and then define and map out the system and processes to achieve it. One comment that hasn't been made is, you know, as receivables age, they become worth less. So mathematically, the value. And so I was in a event last week, and we talk about recession-proofing your business. And one of the caveats is that is tightening up your AR. So as you start looking at your 90-plus receivables, get creative and start approaching your customers earlier as opposed to later, because again, as they continue to age, you're losing your negotiating skill on that. People forget. I mean, it's one of those things that's it's really compromising, but that would be one piece of advice as you start looking at this, is you really need to close it up. And as you look at your day's outstanding sales, if that's not a metric you focus on, meaning what is, what's the average? And how do you bring that in? And you look at all that capital that's sitting out there. And I think that's a best practice that, you know, systems aside, architecture, you're correct. It's imperative to have accurate data so that you can support your claims of receivables, even if you get to litigation. But I think moreover, you know, start focusing on the was problematic, the older stuff, and coming up with strategies today. And you've heard a lot of people like even statements. Maybe you're not doing statements and notices. Maybe you're not doing finance charges to motivate people. Maybe you want to give them some forgiveness to get them to pay their debts and get get your AR closed up. So there's a lot of different tactics that may not be part of a software solution. You certainly want your software to support that. But uh, anyway. Yeah. And, and, and just to add on that, Chris, you know, part of that, you know, look at factoring. Factoring is another you know, go, good option sometimes to be able to factor AR and be that factor would be a customer ERP system that you could kind of, you know, offset it to. Number two is look at that data, you know, look at BI tools because that data is sitting in your ERP system, your ERP system, right? So look at BI tools, get that data out, visualize that data, look at your AR trends, what, what's happening to customer AR, your 90-day AR, right? Um, certain regions of AR, what's happening, right? Look at that visualization of your AR. There's going to be a lot of answers to that. Absolutely. And that is one of the things where, at least in ours, when we built our, our ERP, one of the things that we just debuted last year was we completely revamped our reporting so that it could go to those uh, to those BI tools because that data, you're right, it sits in the system. The ERP is a system of record. The whole point of it is to get that data out. If you know what to look for, you will find it, but you don't want to spend too much time being a detective on it either. The faster you get it out into a BI tool to see what you need, good. Now you can target the people that are going to pay you. Write off what you what you know you can't collect on, send out to collection agency or do a process. Our ERP, one of my favorite things about it, and it's one thing that we consistently want on is our collection process. We actually have um, one of our biggest things is when somebody comes uh, from a smaller business that's looking to scale and they realize they need their first ERP and they're using a dedicated accounting solution, they're like, okay, so we pull the data out in Excel, we start filtering it and running pivot tables and putting conditionals in. I'm like cool, what, what are those conditionals? And in three clicks, I have the same conditionals up in our AR module of our AR aging report. And I just click on them like, so I just did in three clicks as I was conversing with you with my box system, the exact same workflow that you would do. And now I have the invoices that you want to collect on. Oh, by the way, we have automated tools for messaging out. I can send emails. I can give lists to uh, phone calls to be made. I can get all of that out of my system. You can have a PDF generator if you want to mail and stale mail. Good. Now you know all that. Now you can get those things collected on, and hopefully that it, uh, motivates people to pay. I mentioned our payment portal. The more you can get people signed up for auto pay, 
Sure, it might cost, depending on a merchant provider, 3% or so a transaction. But is that 3% to have that cash in hand on the same day you create the invoice worth it? I say yes. Right. Amazing, guys. So we are close to our time now. The only thing we can take is super short closing advice. Abu, I'm actually going to start with you. Just a couple of words. I'm just going to throw in a new topic. You must have litigation strategy. Uh, an interesting comment by one of my customers was, you know, you only they owe you so little. Why are you still litigating? You know, the cost of litigation is higher. He said, I don't want to be known as a free free person in the community. So something else to think about. Okay, amazing advice there. Thank you so much, Abu, for that. Uh, Matt, what would be your closing advice? A few words, please. Absolutely. So closing advice for me is know your process and manage manage it. Uh, know your data. The more transparent you can make your data, the better you can evaluate your process because every business runs differently. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much, Matt, for that advice. Nirav, what would be your closing advice, please? Yeah, I would say for AR, think out of the box, right? Um, don't AR is a process that, that's ready to be disrupted. Uh, so, you know, think outside the box. There's, there's, you can find a lot of ways to make it a little bit more efficient. Okay, amazing. Thank you so much. So that's it for today. If you joined for the first time, this was part of our digital transformation series for which we meet every Thursday at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. We pick one topic related to digital transformation. So make sure you guys are going to be here next week. We are going to come back with another topic and a panel. On that note, thanks everyone for your time and insight tonight. I cannot thank our guests enough for coming on the show, for sharing the knowledge and journey. I always pick up learnings from our guests and hopefully you learned something new today. If you want to learn more about Chris Gerardini, head over to turnkeytech.com. It's T-U-R-N-K-E-Y-T-E-C.com. If you want to learn more about Abu Asif, head over to pennymanagement.com. It's P-A-N-N-I-M-A-N-A-G-E-M-E-N-T.com. If you want to learn more about Matt Bernat, head over to Strivan.com. It's S-T-R-I-V-E-N.com. If you want to learn more about Nirav Shah, head over to AdSirusERP.com. It's A-D-C-I-R-R-U-S-E-R-P.com. Links and more information will also be available in the show notes. If anything in this podcast resonated with you and your business, you might want to check other related episodes, including the interview with Ira Sharp, who shares his insights on open automation and why that is important for manufacturers to understand as they increase the industry 4.0 maturity of their companies. Also, the interview with Jason Anderson, who shares his insights into edge technologies and how manufacturers and field service companies can take advantage of them. Also, don't forget to subscribe and spread the word among folks with similar backgrounds. If you have any questions or comments about the show, please review and rate us on your favorite podcasting platform or DM me on any social channels. I'll try my best to respond personally and make sure you get help. Thank you and I hope to catch you on the next episode of the WBS Podcast. Thank you for listening to another episode of the WBS Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform so you never miss an episode. For more information on growth strategies for SMBs using ERP and digital transformation, check out our community at wbs.rocks. We'll see you next time.